Hi, I'm Ryan Levy. Welcome back to Cyberism's Malicious Life. This episode is part three, the finale of our series about Crypto AG, the world's single largest hacking operation. If you haven't listened to both parts one and two, I recommend you do so now. Thanks and enjoy. The problem with conspiracy theories is that they're illogical, except once in a while, they turn out to be true. Like, for example, how the CIA was spying on civil rights leaders in the 60s, or how the CIA supplied arms to terrorists in South America, or how the CIA trafficked drugs, or how the CIA... Well, you get the idea. Sometimes conspiracies are real, but because they still sound so outlandish, most of us justifiably don't believe them. In fact, why would we want to? To be privy of something the rest of the world is completely unaware is happening. How awful must that be? You could ask Sigmar host Joachim Gruzman, known to his friends and colleagues as Mickey. Mickey was working for the German manufacturing company Siemens when, in 1979, the CIA and BND recruited him to run research and development for Crypto AG. His predecessor, Peter Frudinger, had just been fired for having helped the Syrian military fix their voice encryption equipment. By piecing together, on his own, what his company was really up to, Frudinger had become incredibly dangerous to the CIA. And so Gruzman was treated much differently. His wife recalled a trip to the States where, quote, My husband was away all the time. All he said was he had business meetings, end quote. Speaking to a Swiss documentary crew, she talked about how he couldn't even tell her where he was going during all these secret meetings. When they drove together, she dropped him off blocks away from where he was actually supposed to be. Like one day, quote, It was a road in a forest or a park, and there was a gate no less than 20 or 30 meters wide. I dropped him off, and he went away. Based on what I know today, I guess the CIA was preparing him for what he was meant to do in the firm. End quote. Grootman was made aware of the true purpose of the company, which made him one of only a select few. But as Grootman went country to country, peddling security products he knew were rigged, he started to feel a pressure build. I would regularly pick him up in Zurich, his wife told reporters, and notice a smell of alcohol on his breath. I guess there was something he wanted to numb. A CIA document noted how, quote, he seemed always nervous, a frightened man who shared a secret that he couldn't quite shoulder, end quote. Before long, Grutzmann was fired. But the pressure never left, and after some time, he cracked. He couldn't hide it any longer. He told his family everything. Crypto AG is being controlled by the CIA. In doing that, arguably, Mickey was putting his own life in danger and his family's lives as well. But his wife didn't quite see it that way. Years later, she recalled what it was like to know firsthand about the world's greatest spying operation. Quote, he said, stop talking about crypto. We are being watched. We were not to mention it at all, nor did he want us to mention the CIA. That's what he actually said. And we thought he was a boozer, thinking up some silly stories. We thought he'd gone mad. We didn't take him seriously. End quote. Mickey Grootsman's family could possibly have been the first outside civilians with knowledge of the world's greatest spying operation. They knew all the details firsthand from one of the few people on Earth who could have told him. Yet they didn't believe him. They thought he was losing his mind. To say that Mickey Grootsman was one of only a few people at Crypto AG who knew the purpose of the company may even be an understatement. 
it's likely that he was actually one of only two, that the only other person who knew was the CEO. Which raises the question, how? That's what our final episode in this series is going to explore. How a spying operation affecting over 100 countries for 70 years was kept secret the whole time, from governments, from militaries and intelligence services, and even the company's own personnel. Because Crypto AG, by this point in the story, was large and thriving. At its peak, it employed over 400 people. It's not that hard to keep a secret from some employees. You know, the middle managers, the interns. But we're talking about the people who organize the supply chain for parts. The salesmen peddling these machines, the engineers actually building them, all of them unaware that they were pawns in a grand international espionage plot. Most of them. The attack surface has never been larger or more diverse, yet defenders are still forced to piece together intelligence from numerous siloed solutions that produce a flood of alerts in order to detect and end complex malicious operations. No more. Defenders can now leverage AI-driven Cyberism XDR powered by Google Chronicle to predict, understand, and end sophisticated attacks with the only solution on the market that delivers planetary-scale protection that allows them to predict attacker behavior through a revolutionary, operation-centric detection and response approach. Cyberism and Google Cloud are dedicated to teaming with defenders to end cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more about Cyberism XDR, powered by Google Chronicle, at cyberism.com slash platform slash XDR. In our last episode, you met Heinz Wagner the charismatic, good-looking CEO of Crypto AG in the 1970s. Wagner was an effective businessman, but made some crucial mistakes. One such mistake was hiring a woman named Mengia Kaflisch. Dr. Kaflisch was an extremely gifted electrical engineer. Young and good-looking, with large brown eyes and tan skin, she spent her early career as a radio astronomy researcher at the University of Maryland, then decided to return home to Switzerland. So she applied to work for Crypto AG. Wagner recognized her obvious talent. As the Washington Post writes, he, quote, jumped at the chance to hire her, end quote. NSA officials also recognized her unique skill, but they reacted differently. To them, she was, quote, too bright to remain unwitting, end quote. Soon after joining, Kaflish began to probe Crypto AG's cipher machines, looking for any weaknesses. She probably just wanted to help. She probably thought it was her job. She started working with a colleague from her department named Jörg Sporndeli. Sporndelli was another engineer too talented for his own good. Like Kaflisch, he thought, quote, the algorithms always looked fishy, end quote. So just a few months prior, on his own, he optimized the crypto logic for Crypto AG's T450, an encryption device designed for teleprinter communications. With Sporndelli's changes, the T45 algorithm became completely impenetrable. According to the Crypto Museum, quote, the event led to an internal crisis at Crypto AG, but in the end, the NSA won the argument, end quote. They re-weakened the algorithm. With her talent and his knowledge he had of the teleprinter vulnerabilities, Keflish and Sporndelli ran a series of plain text attacks against some other models. As he recalls, quote, we looked at the internal operations and the dependencies with each step. End quote. Using an HC570, 
a desktop encryptor that looks like an Apple II computer, they discovered that they could crack messages by comparing just a hundred enciphered characters with the original unencrypted text. Imagine you're sending a message, a long one, maybe a top-secret intelligence report. So long as the adversary has, or can guess, around a hundred characters of that message, using this plain text attack method, they can decode the rest. A hundred characters, for reference, is only about as long as the sentence I'm currently narrating to you now. Kaflish continued to probe other models for security holes. At one point, she created a cryptologic algorithm so secure that the NSA couldn't break it. Somehow, it slipped past censorship and onto the factory floor. Crypto AG manufactured 50 uncrackable HC740s before the NSA discovered what was going on. At that point, they restored the vulnerable algorithm and sold the 50 unbreakable 740s to banks in order to keep them away from foreign government targets. The more Kaflish looked into it, the more confusing it became. Quote, I just had an idea that something might be strange, she told reporters. But when she asked what was going on, quote, not all questions appeared to be welcome. More of her colleagues began to develop their own suspicions. Another engineer spoke anonymously with the Baltimore Sun. Quote, On numerous occasions, this engineer says, he was given schematic diagrams for the algorithms, the crucial mathematical formulas that control the encryption. Though the designs were handed over to him by superiors at crypto, it became clear to him that they were developed outside the company by the mysterious U.S. and German visitors who occasionally came to the plant. End quote. The word was that these visitors were quote-unquote consultants from a firm called Intercom Associates. As more questions arose, Heinz Wagner couldn't preserve the mystery any longer. He convened a meeting of selected members of Crypto AG's R&D department and admitted, finally, that the company, quote, was not entirely free to do what it wanted. End quote. Some assumed that that meant government regulators were involved. Because what else could it be? That their company was being puppeted by shady secret agents from foreign governments? As Kaflish told the Post, quote, either you had to leave or you had to accept it in a certain way. End quote. And that's how you keep a secret from 400 employees. Were there signs? Of course. But the truth behind Crypto AG was just so outlandish that even when they saw the big red flags, employees were willing to accept the explanations they were given. It was just easier that way. So that's how employees were kept in the dark. But what about countries? It's almost unbelievable when you think about it. At least 60, if not over 100 nations, were impacted in the seven decades of Crypto AG's operation. Their governments and militaries had their own top-level engineers vetting the equipment severely as it would be used directly in the most sensitive communications imaginable. How didn't they find out what was going on? In fact, some of them did. What's interesting is that even after they discovered something was wrong, they continued to buy Higlin machines. Consider Argentina. In 1977, the new military junta governing Argentina purchased Higlin H4605 machines and arranged for the same machines to be sold to other South American dictatorships in the Operation Condor network. Shortly thereafter, however, officers began to suspect that something was wrong. They summoned a group of officials from the company, including the charismatic CEO, Heinz Wagner, to come visit them and talk. From the Washington Post, quote, 
the Argentines demonstrated their attack, showing weaknesses in the crypto equipment, and demanded an explanation, a CIA document says. Wagner was frightened almost out of his wits. This was a regime that reportedly threw dissenters out of airplanes unequipped with parachutes. Who would miss an obscure Swiss CEO who failed to return from a business trip? End quote. Crypto's executives, to avoid, you know, being thrown out of a plane, offered a fix. It was a fake fix, of course, that made the machines superficially more secure, but in fact, still readable. You might ask, why did the Argentines agree to keep buying with Crypto AG if they figured out the company was trying to dupe them the first time? Well, quote, they accepted on the promise that crypto officials not tip off other Latin American countries that also were crypto customers. Buenos Aires wanted its neighbors to remain ignorant of the vulnerability so that Argentina could spy on them. End quote. The Argentine military junta remained a customer until five years later, in 1982, Argentina attacked British territories in the South Atlantic Ocean. The Falklands War was a surprise, catching Britain completely off guard. This in spite of the fact that Argentina was a customer of Crypto AG, and so Britain, through America, had visibility into their internal communications. Distraught and angry, Ted Rowlands, Minister of State for the UK Foreign Office, got on the floor of Parliament and declared his dismay. Quote, I have great difficulty in understanding how the intelligence failed. Our intelligence in Argentina was extremely good. That is why we took action in 1977. We found out that certain attitudes and approaches were being formed. I cannot believe that the quality of our intelligence has changed. Last night, the Secretary of State for Defense asked, how can we read the mind of the enemy? I shall make a disclosure. As well as trying to read the mind of the enemy, we have been reading its telegrams for many years. I am sure that many sources are available to the government, and I do not understand how they failed to anticipate some of the dangers that suddenly loomed on the horizon. End quote. The Argentines now knew that they were being spied on, yet they remained customers of Crypto AG for another dozen years. In that, they were just like so many other countries, which even after discovering the machines were vulnerable, ultimately continued to buy them. The reason why is ultimately the reason why so many other customers that might have otherwise picked up on the ruse, in fact, did not. Because Crypto AG had a very few special people, like Kyle Ove Widman. In the late 70s, as engineers like Kaflish, Spondelli and others, and as countries like Argentina were slowly catching onto the scam, the CIA and BND went out to recruit someone who could improve their algorithms. Someone who could make them appear stronger without making them actually any stronger. That's how they found Widman. Widman was a celebrated mathematician and cryptologist and a close partner of Swedish intelligence. It was relevant, too, that as a student he'd spend a year in Washington state where he developed an affinity for America. So, in all, he was a prime candidate for Crypto AG. From the Washington Post, quote, Officials involved in Widman's recruitment described it as almost effortless. After being groomed by Swedish intelligence officials, he was brought to Munich in 1979 for what purported to be a round of interviews with executives from Crypto and Siemens. The fiction was maintained as Widman faced questions from half dozen men seated around a table in a hotel conference room. As a group broke for lunch, two men asked Widman to stay behind for a private conversation. Do you know what ZFCH is? 
asked Jelto Brumeinster, a BND case officer, using the acronym for the German Cipher Service. When Widman replied that he did, Brumeister said, Now, do you understand who really owns Crypto AG? At that point, Widman was introduced to Richard Schrudner, a CIA officer stationed in Munich to manage the agency's involvement in crypto. Widman would later claim to agency historians that his world fell apart completely in that moment. If so, he did not hesitate to enlist in the operation. Without even leaving the room, Widman sealed his recruitment with a handshake. As the three men joined the rest of the group at lunch, a thumbs-up signal transformed the gathering into a celebration. End quote. Widman was made a scientific advisor, but according to the CIA, he was much more. Irreplaceable they called him, the, quote, most important recruitment in the history of the Minerva program, end quote. He bought into the plot 100% and was so intimidatingly intelligent that nobody wished to question his work. Quote, his stature cowed subordinates, investing him with a technical prominence that no one in Crypto AG could challenge. It also helped deflect the inquiries of foreign governments. End quote. Whitman helped create a new set of algorithms which were, quote, undetectable by usual statistical tests and, if discovered, be easily masked as implementation or human errors. End quote. So, in 1982, when a British MP let slip that GCHQ was reading Argentine military government communications for years, it was Whitman who was sent to quell the situation. Widman explained to the junta it was probably that the NSA had cracked their outdated speech scramblers. Their crypto machines? Huh, he could demonstrate for them just how unbreakable they were. As the CIA recalled, quote, the bluff worked. The Argentines swallowed hard, but kept buying crypto AG equipment. End quote. By giving employees the impression that they were government-regulated and convincing countries that they were not, in fact, the source of their communication hacks, Crypto AG maintained its legitimacy for decades. Even still, it's remarkable that they survived the mid-1990s. In 1994, Peter Frudinger appeared on Swiss television and explained the whole plot. It didn't work. Crypto's new CEO, Michael Gruppe, appeared in a TV interview shortly thereafter, and according to the internal CIA history, quote, Gruppe's performance was credible and may have saved the program, end quote. One year later, the Baltimore Sun newspaper ran a series of articles exposing Crypto AG as an NSA operation. If you go back and read it, it becomes very obvious that they were not only 100% correct, but got almost all the details to a whole quarter century before anybody really cared to listen. Around half a dozen countries paused or ended their crypto AG contracts as a result of the increased scrutiny during this period. But remember, crypto AG had around 60 countries on its books. 90% of them, apparently, didn't watch Swiss TV or read newspapers from Baltimore. The company continued on until in the mid-2010s, the mysterious, undisclosed investors behind Crypto AG began to break it up. According to the Post, quote, the transactions seemed designed to provide cover for a CIA exit. The Swiss part of the business was transferred to a firm called Saiwan, and much of the rest of the business was sold to a man named Andreas Linde. Linde is a Swedish entrepreneur, like his antecedent Hagelin, but with a friendlier face, calmed blonde hair, light blue eyes, and big round cheeks. Linde had previously founded a risk management company, a cybersecurity company, and was CEO of Advenica, 
a $500 million company based in his home country. He was then drawn to Crypto AG for its Swedish heritage and because of the legendary Boris Hagelin. Following his acquisition in 2018, in fact, he put some of Hagelin's historic machines on display at the entrance of their machine factory. To be clear, though, Linde hadn't bought the Crypto AG company, just most of its assets, the international accounts and products and so on. The headquarters itself was sold to a separate real estate company, and Linde's company operated as an entirely different entity from that which operated Crypto AG prior. This is an important distinction because of what happened in January 2020. Two years after his acquisition, seven whole decades after William Friedman and Boris Hagelin shook hands on their gentleman's agreement, Linde sat down with a reporter from the Washington Post. Quote, When confronted with evidence that crypto had been owned by the CIA and BND, Linde looked visibly shaken. End quote. Linde told the reporter, through the entire acquisition process, he'd never learned the identities of crypto's beneficiaries. It might sound surprising, but remember... In the very early days, Haglin himself had arranged a series of shell companies in Liechtenstein through which he could avoid the high taxation in Switzerland. Later, the CIA and BND leveraged the same network to hide their ownership, even from their own governments. Quote, when asked why he failed to confront those who were involved in the transaction about whether there was any truth to the long-standing crypto allegations, Linda said he had regarded these as just rumors. End quote. One month later, the world learned the truth about crypto AG. The Swiss government suspended Linda's expert licenses, and the company laid off its entire workforce as they headed for bankruptcy. It's somewhat ironic how it happened that way. The Crypto Museum explained how, quote, although it was initially thought that all evidence had been destroyed, a Swiss parliamentary commission later found a trove of documents in a so-called k Lodge, a Cold War atomic bunker in which state secret documents are kept. The documents confirmed that the Swiss government had been aware of the operation from at least 1993 onwards and that they had used the intelligence derived from the operation. End quote. Maybe it's because COVID-19 was breaking out at the very moment Crypto AG was revealed. Maybe it's because other countries were embarrassed to admit their failures. But the fact remains, even after seven decades of spying, the governments of the United States, Germany, Switzerland, and other countries that benefited from the Crypto AG operation never really experienced any consequences for it. Instead, all the consequences fell to the individuals who didn't know better. Andreas Linde, who must have lost a fortune, Employees of Crypto AG, who never had any clue that the work they dedicated their lives to was in fact on behalf of foreign governments. I feel betrayed, one technician told the Sun. They always told us, we are the best, our equipment is not breakable, blah, blah, blah. Switzerland is a neutral country. Mengia Kaflisch continued to work for Crypto AG for over a decade and a half until the age of 50. During all that time, she never learned the full truth. There were reasons I left, she told reporters, recalling the suspicions she had and the pushback she faced for it. When the full story was revealed to her as a 75-year-old woman, she lamented. Quote, it makes me wonder whether I should have left earlier. End quote. Eventually, Jörg Sprondelli had pieced together why Crypto AG kept rejecting his improved algorithms. He told reporters why, even though he knew he never revealed the truth. Quote, I told myself sometimes it may be better if the good guys in the United States know what is going on between these third world dictators. But it's a cheap self-excuse. In the end... This is not the way. End quote. Four decades after the fact, 
Mickey Goodman's family received the news along with the rest of us. He wasn't crazy after all. His rantings and ravings about CIA spying, he was telling them the truth the whole time. Think about all those years of suffering, of living with a secret, of shouting it out to the world and not being believed. The story of Crypto AG was revealed to the world in February of 2020, but Grootsman had passed away in 2016, just four years before he would have received his long overdue validation. Speaking to a documentary film crew, there's a point at which Grootsman's wife puts her head down, thinking, too sad to talk about it. Her daughter, sitting beside her, speaks for her. Quote, It really hurts when you think of it. That's it for this episode and for the whole Crypto AG series. Thank you for listening and kudos to our producer Nate Nelson who worked so hard over the last few weeks to bring you this amazing and quite complicated story. Shout out to our wonderful listeners who wrote nice things about us on Twitter and recommended the show to their followers. Dave, a crypto punk who claims to be a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Thanks, Dave. But that's just like... Your opinion, man. To Ryo Kimball, who does stuff, and hello, Twitty NYC, who's from, well, New York City, I guess. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. This episode was produced by Nate Nielsen. Yotam Halachmi did the sound design. Our website is malicious.life, and you can follow us on Twitter at at maliciouslife, or follow me at at ranlevi. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I. My email address is ren at renlevy.com. Thanks to CyberReason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Oh my God.